We're going to get started in a minute, folks. Uh, I know the weather has made it uh, a little trickier to get here, but um, we're going to, and we're also having a few uh, additional copies of, of materials made. But I think I will start off and first of all welcome all of you for coming today and battling the elements to, to get here. I'm Steve Miley. I'm the director of the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic here at the University of Minnesota Law School, which is part of the Binger Center for New Americans. And we are co-sponsoring this event uh, with the U of M Immigration Response Team, which is headed by Marissa Hildongre, who is with us today as well. And we're also joined by several uh, experts in the area of uh, the, the public charge uh, proposed rule, both from a legal perspective, but also from a public benefits perspective, because it's a proposal that lies at the intersection of those two areas. Um, uh, and they're going to offer uh, some of their perspective after we hear from, from the law students. We've got uh, John Keller from the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, Peggy Russell and Ann Quincy from Mid-Minnesota Legal Assistance, Laura Melnick from Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services, and Michelle Riviero uh, with the City of Minneapolis Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. So uh, lots of expertise here. Uh, um, and they will uh, add to the discussion uh, in a bit. Um, uh, the way we're going to proceed today is that we've got four law students in the clinic. We'll introduce in a second. They're going to talk about the basics of the rule, uh, the, the rule on um, uh, public charge. And uh, then they're also going to talk about the rulemaking uh, process because part of the reason for this forum is to um, uh, talk to you about that, that process. We're in the It is a proposed rule. We're in the middle of the rulemaking process. There's an opportunity for the public to submit comments to um, uh, hopefully influence the, what the final rule looks like. And so we're going to have a, a combination of description of the, of, of the proposed rule itself, some of the basics, not too much detail on that, and then the rulemaking uh, process. We got involved in this because uh, students in the clinic prepared an analysis of the proposed rule. We've got copies of it here, and there are other materials as well. Um, uh, we prepared that, uh, that analysis for the International Refugee Assistance Project. We got interested in the rule because it's, it's uh, a proposal affecting the rights of uh, non-citizens uh, in ways that hasn't garnered a whole lot of public attention, and certainly a lot less than some of the um, bigger splash items, such as the wall or, or the travel ban. But it's uh, certainly clear that if this rule is promulgated as proposed, it will affect most likely more non-citizens than, uh, than either of those proposals, particularly non-citizens within the United States. Uh, the, the figure that jumped out at us as we did research on this, because basically what the proposed rule does, uh, and we'll hear more about it in a little bit, but it expands the scope uh, or the criteria by which people are determined to be public charges and therefore inadmissible to the United States. In the past, that determination was based in part on the receipt of cash benefits. The proposed rule expands that criteria to include non-cash benefits. And so the figure that jumped out at us was about 3% of non-citizens currently uh, in, in the US receive cash benefits, but nearly 50% receive non-cash benefits. So you can see that uh, the proposed rule by expanding the, uh, by expanding the criteria uh, for determining whether or not somebody is a public charge, that will have a significant impact on a large percentage of non-citizens. Um, so again, the way we're going to proceed is that I'm going to uh, first have the students come up and uh, provide their uh, insights into the proposed rule. So we've got Emily Thornton, uh, Anna Somberg, Leslie Rowe, and Dante Haratunian. And they're going to go in that order. And it'll take about 20 minutes. And then we'll hear from uh, the folks uh, who have come from those agencies that I indicated 
earlier, then we'll have Q and A, and then Marissa's gonna gonna close out with some comments about uh, about the process. So uh, Emily, why don't you start out? We're using a mic, by the way, because we it is being filmed. Even though we're in a relatively small room, we still have to use the mic, and uh, we'll be passing the mic around uh, during the Q and A session as well. So as Professor Miley said, we're going to explain briefly um, what's included in the proposed rule. So first, I'm going to give a brief explanation. Um, then Anna is going to go over some of the broader implications of the proposed rule. Then Leslie and Dante will go over um, what the notice and comment period is and how you can get involved in the comment process. So on October 10th, the Department of Homeland Security issued a proposed rule on inadmissibility on public charge grounds. So at several points in the immigration process, immigration officers can determine that non-citizens are inadmissible to the United States because they are likely to become a public charge. So in other words, they're likely to become dependent on the government for support. Immigration officers make these determinations um, at several points. So that includes when non-citizens are initially applying to enter the US. Also, when non-citizens apply to become a permanent resident, so when they're applying for a green card. Um, it also applies when someone with a green card is applying or is re-entering the U.S. after being outside of the country for more than six months. Um, additionally, public charge, charge grounds may apply when a non-citizen applies for a non-immigrant visa, so for example, a student visa, or an extension of that visa, or a change in status. When a non-citizen is declared inadmissible to the U.S., that then becomes ground for deportation. Um, public charge grounds, however, do not apply to people with green cards applying for citizenship. Um, it also doesn't apply to green card renewals. Um, and there are several other categories of non-citizens who are exempt from this rule um, and public charge grounds in general. Um, and those include refugees, asylees, um, BAWA self-petitioners, special immigrant juveniles, um, and non-citizens who have received a U or a T visa, uh, humanitarian parole, or temporary protected status, among other categories. Um, if you have any questions about any of these categories, feel free to ask later. Um, so before I explain what's included in the proposed rule, I'm first going to go over um, what the current public charge policy is. So under current policy, a public charge is someone who is primarily dependent or likely to become primarily dependent on the government for support. When immigration officers make public charge determinations, they use what's called a totality of the circumstances test, which means that they consider several factors about the individual non-citizen to determine whether they think they're likely to become dependent on the government. Those factors include age, health, family status, financial status, and education and skills. Um, it's a balancing test, so certain factors can show that a uh, non-citizen is likely to be self-sufficient, um, and those can weigh against other factors that might show that a non-citizen is likely to become um, dependent on the government. Under current policy, as Professor Miley said, immigration officers can only consider non-cash public benefits um, for ma income maintenance, and those include SSI, temporary assistance for needy families, and general assistance. They can also consider long-term institutionalization at the government's expense. Um, so they currently cannot consider non-cash public benefits. Um, however, under the proposed rule, um, DHS is proposing to change what's defined as a public charge. Um, so under the rule, it will be defined as a non-citizen who receives one or more public benefits. Um, immigration officers will still use the totality of the circumstances test, um, but the proposed rule will modify what's considered positive and negative under those factors. So for example, under the age factor, it will be, um, it will weigh against a non-citizen if they're under the age of 18 or over the age of 61, because it's presumed that they aren't working or they're unable to work. Um, under the health factor, it will weigh against a non-citizen if they have a medical condition that's likely to require extensive treatment or um, interfere with their ability to work or go to school. Under the financial status factor, it will count against an individual if they um, have an, a yearly household income that is less than 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. 
So if a non-citizen lives in a household of four people um, and their yearly income is less than around $31,000, um, their financial status would weigh against them in that totality of the, cir totality of the circumstances test. Um, however, none of these factors alone are conclusive. Again, it's a balancing test. So, for example, just because someone is over the age of 61, which is um, considered negative under the age factor, um, they won't necessarily be deemed a public charge. Um, they might have other factors like um, income, they may still be working, they may be in good health, which could potentially outweigh any other negative factors, including age. Um, and the main change under this proposed rule is that immigration officers will now be able to consider more than just cash benefits. So this is one of the most significant changes in the rule. As Professor Miley said, um, a lot more non-citizens receive non-cash assistance than just cash assistance. Um, and so in addition to the cash benefits that are already included, so those are SSI, temporary assistance for needy families, and general assistance, um, immigration officers will consider receipt of Medicaid, the low-income subsidy of Medicare Part D, um, SNAP, formerly called food stamps, um, Section 8 housing assistance, and other subsidized housing. Um, and finally, um, the proposed rule is not retroactive, so immigration officers will not consider public benefits applied for um, or received before the date that the final rule is enacted. Um, and so now Anna is going to talk about some of the implications of this rule. So now that you know a little bit about the rule, I'm going to tell you some of the likely effects that you might want to mention in your comments. So DHS's stated purpose for this rule is to promote self-sufficiency. However, there are a number of impacts of the proposed rule that will be detrimental. I'm going to speak about five of them. Number one, the proposed rule will disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. Number two, it will be bad for public health. Number three, it creates uncertainty in the public benefits community. Number four, it will hurt the economy. And number five, it will hurt families. And we mention all of these in greater detail in our analysis, which we have copies of over there. So I'm just going to summarize some of the main things in the interest of time. Number one, the proposed rule will disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. So this includes children, people with disabilities, people of color, and others. So for children, as Emily said, um, being under the age of 18 is a negative factor, and children are, weirdly enough, usually under 18, and therefore more likely to be a public charge. Also, uh, health and nutrition are particularly important for children's mental and physical development. So the lack of access to healthy food and medical care will have long-term effects on children. As for people with disabilities, under federal regulations, DHS is not supposed to discriminate against people with disabilities, which is why they say in the rule that they're not discriminating against people with disabilities. But it's a negative factor to have any medical condition that affects a person's ability to work, go to school, or financially support themselves. So in other words, a disability can actually count against someone in the public charge determination. And this is not just physical disabilities, but mental health conditions as well, which as a recent study that the U of M conducted um, showed, uh, this is increasingly prevalent among college students. So for people of color, immigrant communities of color um, have lower incomes on average, and there's an employment gap between um, immigrants of color and white immigrants. So both of those factors will impact people of color more than white immigrants. Number two, the proposed rule will be bad for public health. DHS even says in the proposed rule, because basically they have to state the potential impacts, that the rule could lead to more communicable diseases, including among US citizens, and also worse health outcomes, especially for pregnant women and children. Uh, the rule will also block access to mental health treatment, which and it will actually create more mental health um, issues due to the increased levels of stress and anxiety that accompany economic instability. Number three, the proposed rule will and has already created uh, 
uncertainty in the public benefits community. Basically, professionals who advise immigrants and their families about public benefits are put into the position that if they advise people to use available programs, that could lead someone to being deemed a public charge. Um, number four, the proposed rule will, will hurt the economy. DHS, again, because they have to state the impacts, say in the rule that it could lead to more poverty, housing instability, uncompensated care, and reduced revenues for health care providers that participate in Medicaid and for companies that manufacture medical supplies. Also, local economies and small businesses will suffer due to disenrollment in SNAP and housing programs. Also, as I said before, children will be hit particularly hard. And the loss of nutrition health care for children will lead to poor levels of education and development, which in the long run will actually lead to lower levels of self-sufficiency. Number five, the proposed rule will hurt families. So since a person's household income has to exceed the federal poverty guideline for their household size, this indirectly makes having a family a negative factor under the proposed rule. And the larger the family is, the worse off that it is for them. Also, mixed status families will be torn apart if one of the family members is deemed a public charge. Also, immigrants who come to the US for family-related reasons will have a harder time being admitted under this rule than people coming for employment reasons. Also, families are already disenrolling their US-born citizen children from public programs uh, because they're afraid of what's going to happen to their families under this rule if they don't. Okay, so now that you've heard some about the substance of what's in the proposed rule, Dante and I are going to talk um, about the comment process. Um, so I'm going to give a general overview about what a comment is and why it's important to make them. And then Dante will talk more specifically about how to do that um, and give you some tangible examples of what might make a good comment. So the first important reason that um, we should all comment on this rule is that it could influence the final rule. So where we are in this process right now is that DHS has issued notice um, of the substance of the rule. We're now in the comment period, and then um, DHS will have the opportunity to review and respond to those comments in formulating a final rule. So there's an opportunity to impact um, the substance of the rule potentially. Um, second. Comments can cause the administration to consider important um, implications of the rule. So to the extent that um, someone's individual experience um, in public health, for example, or in the education context can shed light on um, further implications of what this rule might mean, those are useful comments. Um, third, comments can demonstrate public support or opposition to public policies. Um, so it's an important way to participate in the democratic process um, and an easy way to get involved. Um, and then fourth and kind of less importantly, um, for these purposes, in some circumstances, um, if the administration doesn't respond adequately to the comments that are received, that could set up um, a procedural challenge in the future. Um, so now Dante is going to talk about what makes a good comment. So the first thing you'll probably all want to know is how and where to make comments. There are two uh, different ways to provide comments. The first, and the one that the government prefers, and the one that I imagine most of you probably prefer, is to go to the regulations website, which is up there. Um, this is what it will look like when you go. Um, right now, and this has been the case for quite a while, um, the rule in admissibility of public charge has been at the top of the trending list, and it's probably going to stay there, so you can just click on it. Um, but if for some reason it is gone from there when you go here, uh, you can enter in the doc docket number in this search bar, um, which is 2010. Uh, 0012, which is also up on the board and on all your sheets, and it'll be the first result to come up. Now to leave a comment, you can either click directly on the comment now button, you see that comes up next to it, or you can click on the rule itself, and after reading through it, the comment now button is also in the top right hand corner. Um, additionally, if you want to look at other comments that are on there, you can scroll down to view all comments on the right hand side of the page. Now, for those of you who love snail mail or for some other reason want to uh, send in the uh, comments by mail, you can do that. 
Uh, the address that you send it to is on the cheat sheet. Um, there's two things to keep in mind with that. One, the same deadline, which is December 10th, applies. However, the letters only need to be postmarked by December 10th, whereas if you submit a, kind of, a comment online, it must actually sub be submitted online December 10th. Um, and secondly, if you're using the mail, make sure to include the actual docket number of the rule in the letter so that they actually know which rule you're commenting on. Now, for those of you who haven't submitted a comment before, I'm going to quickly go through one way to potentially structure um, a comment just so it's easier um, for you to communicate what you're trying to say and for uh, the government to understand it. Um, however, there is no one correct way to provide a comment, so keep that in mind. Feel free to deviate as much as you want. The first step is you should start with an introduction. If possible, explain why you're interested in the rule and how it would affect you or your community or your organization. Um, if you have any credentials, be that doctor who works with patients, concerned citizen, community member, uh, law student who works with the community, uh, you can include that as well. Um, next, you should move on and state what, if any, problems or critiques you have of the rule, and if you have any recommendations um, for how to change the rule or whether or not you think they should adopt the rule, you should include that in that section as well. Next, uh, you should uh, provide sort of an analysis section where you back up what you were saying in the previous <coughs> section. If you have any evidence, any um, journals or news articles or anything that you're citing, make sure to include the citation. Um, so that it's easier for the government to look and see what it is you're referring to. And then finally, you can end with a conclusion in which you restate what your um, problems with the rule were or what your recommendations for the rule are. Now, um, before we move on, while you're thinking about leaving comments on public rules, we would like to draw your attention to another rule which is currently uh, in its uh, public comment period, and that is the rule that the Trump administration issued about a month ago, um, the interim final rule on asylum. Um, we could give an entire other presentation about that, but a quick and dirty explanation of it is that it prevents people who cross the southern border not at a designated port of entry from applying for asylum in the United States. Um, the Trump, unlike the um, public charge proposal, which is still just a proposal, it hasn't actually been implemented yet, the Trump administration invoked an exception um, for certain uh, good cause or emergency to have this rule go into effect already. However, it has been stayed by a judge as of right now. Um, and the deadline for that rule is to leave comments is January 8th. And the docket number is also up on the board. And while for the public charge comment, there have been over, I think, 10,000 or right about thereabouts comments left, there have been a grand total of 55 on that one. So your comments may have a fairly greater impact for that one. Thanks very much. The other thing to point out, um, Dante uh, on the um, cheat sheet uh, has a few model comments towards, towards the end, uh, mostly the, the uh, positive models, but then there's, a, there's a, on the final page, there's, there's a couple of tips about what to avoid in terms of uh, uh, making comments, such as profanity and, <laughs> and boilerplate instructions like insert X. You probably don't want to put that in, in, in your comments. So uh, before we open the floor uh, for questions, I just wanted to ask any of the folks from uh, the relevant agencies or the city of, of Minneapolis if you all have uh, things to add to to what the students have talked about, given your own experience and, and the communities that, that you're serving. Here's another mic. If you can introduce yourselves. Hi, so my name is Michelle Rivero. I'm the director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the city of Minneapolis. And the city of Minneapolis has been working on preparing a comment to this proposed rule over the course of the last month or so. And one of the challenges that we've seen is trying to identify impacts that are based on the chilling effect of the proposed rule. And that's, in some respects, invisible. And and so what we've been trying to do, I've actually been going to 
meetings within the health department and have reached out to the public housing authority to explain what this rule means and I did prepare a summary that um, is available here too um, and, and ask questions on how the individuals who work with these respective agencies can inquire in a way that elicits the information that they need to see whether there is in fact a chilling effect. So whether it be Minneapolis public schools and, and parents not wanting to sign their children up for reduced price lunch or um, uh, Head Start, for example, people disenrolling from Head Start, um, public housing authority people deciding not to register for public housing or not to obtain Section 8 benefits, although those benefits are very valuable and the number of immigrants who um, uh, would be subjected to the public charge rule who would even qualify for those types of benefits is very small. It's very important to take into consideration those less visible impacts. So that's what we're trying to do. And um, if individuals in this room have suggestions or based on their own backgrounds, please feel free to communicate with me. Thank you. Laura. I'm Laura Melnick from Smurls in St. Paul. And um, one thing, two things. One, um, I think there have been 95,000 comments submitted so far. Is that right? 99,000, okay. Um, so, yeah. And, but um, I want to just um, emphasize or reiterate what Michelle just said that. The impact for my clients, my clients are mostly refugees and asylees, and the impact for them is the, the invisible, the indirect result of this rule. I think a lot of my clients, <clears throat> even the U.S. citizen clients, are going to be hesitant to continue receiving benefits that they're otherwise eligible for, including medical assistance, food stamps, um, public housing, Section 8 housing, and, and the benefits there that actually won't matter because they don't know like Head Start and school reduced school lunch and breakfast benefits um, because they want to help bring a family member over. At least half of my refugee clients have family members in other countries that they hope to bring to the United States. And they're potentially going to be affected. And it's not unrealistic for them to not want to get benefits if, if getting benefits is going to affect their ability to to bring relatives to the United States. So I think one of our tasks is to, when we're talking to our clients, is to let them know that um, there are certain benefits that are safe benefits that won't affect them in any respect and kind of go through what those benefits are. And then also to find out from them how realistic it is for them to be able to bring people over. Because if they're not going to be able to bring people over, they shouldn't suffer by depriving themselves and their children of needed benefits. Unfortunately, a lot of the benefits, even though there's no derivative problem here, so in other words, what the government is going to be looking at is the benefits that the people receive directly themselves, not what their children receive. Um, it's m Many of the benefit programs don't allow you to separate out. So like the TANF program, MFIP, Minnesota Family Investment, which is our family cash assistance program, you can't um, take yourself off the grant and let your U.S. citizen kids continue to receive those benefits. You're a package. <clears throat> you have to be included in the grant. It's the same with SNAP, food stamps for children. And so, and with regard to medical, um, you can't choose to go on Minnesota Care, which is safe, and stop receiving MA if you're otherwise el eligible for MA. That's in the Minnesota Care statute. So that's the problem that I see. And I, I see potential long ranging effects for my clients. So. Okay. My name is Norma Garces, and I'm the executive director of a charter school, a colegio charter school. That is, 93% of my students are U.S. citizens, but 90% of the parents are undocumented. So we've seen a drop of um, really getting involved with any benefit. They don't want to have any anything to do with anything, and. Um, 
I have exactly the same concerns. What is hard for us, because we're not lawyers, <laughs> we're teachers, is, um, and that's what I came to find out, if you have anything that we can honestly tell the, the, um, the parent or the student that this will affect you or this will not affect you, because they don't want to receive free and reduced lunch. If a students drop, if I, 10 more students drop free and reduced lunch from my school, I lose the benefits of the whole school. So that's how much is going to affect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, sure. I'm Ann Quincy. I'm a benefits attorney, just as Laura is. I work in Hennepin County and at uh, MMLA. We've been going out. In fact, there's a flyer for we're going to Green Central tomorrow night or tonight. Um, we've been going out, especially to schools, to do outreach events and talk to parents, talk to families, talk to impacted communities about what they fear the, pro the proposed rule is, what they fear the current rule is, and to talk them back. <laughs> Uh, walk them back from, from that fear to what is real. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, really works. When we really sit down and talk to parents individually or in groups where they feel like they can express their darkest fears, we really, <clears throat> we really can impact their ability to get a benefit and not worry. Um, we did a poster last year, uh, Legal Aid did, with the help of uh, Cura, mm -hmm. um, on the safety of getting food benefits like SNAP, but also separately free and reduced lunch, because it's not the same. Mm -hmm. We did a poster on it, and then we published it in Spanish, posted the posters, and then this year, Second Harvest took the poster, reduced it, and really did a big push in South St. Paul where a lot of the families were saying, I'm not going to enroll in free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. And they saw a significant increase in the number of fa fa families that said, I'll, I'll accept free and reduced lunch, especially when the benefit you're talking about, which is called community eligibility, as opposed to individual eligibility, is explained to families. You don't sign up for my fam. I don't sign up for my family. I sign up and say my income is such and such. The data about my name is stripped from that, and the school gets the benefit because 50% of the families qualify. So, and in fact, our Department of Human Services in Minnesota um, has on staff Roberta Downing, the woman who created that rule. Uh, under the SNAP program a few years ago when she was in DC. So we have the resources to come and talk and, yes, and to explain to families. And, and while I can appreciate the fear, you know, the concern about uh, of families saying, I, I, I need to just get off everything, if that's the decision they want to make, I'm not here to talk them into it. But they need to understand the reality of if your child, it's not about whether your child got food stamps when they were little and then turned 21 and wanted to sponsor you. It's about whether when they turn 21, they have a job, they have income over 125% of poverty or better so that they can sponsor you. And and if that's not realistic, if the child is on SSI at 21, depriving the child of that benefit isn't going to help anybody. Um, but, but we get this question all the time when we go out and do outreach. We get that question. My child, who's 10, I don't want them on medical assistance because when they turn 21, I want them to be able to sponsor me. Okay, well, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Hope they get a job. <laughs> um, the fear around getting benefits when kids are little is, is outsized. And, and what we're really fighting here is this chilling effect. And that is going to be absolutely one of the most important comments to make. Citizens, US citizens, naturalized citizens are afraid that this impacts them. Yes. We have people ask us every day yes. when we go out and do outreach. I think that the people who are undocumented, they know I'm not going to go in anything as much as possible. I think they're, they're not eligible. They're it's not okay. even <laughs> eligible. But I think they said, 
beyond true concern, like real, real concern that I'm, I'm 19 years old, I'm about to graduate from high school. Right. Do, do I do FAFSA? Yes, you do FAFSA. Yes, you do FAFSA. You do, you know, so we're dealing with very real fear of, right. of the government. Yeah. Of I, I'm, are we all going to send back? Are we, you know, like so it's a daily conversation over um, what do they qualify yeah. or not? Yeah, and that's why. So we've created a flyer. We encourage people yeah. to use the flyer that Smurls has created. Pass it out. We want people to ask individuals to ask the question of trusted resources. The department again, the Department of Human Services. Not the DHS that issued the rule, the other one. Um, that's Homeland Security issued the rule. Minnesota's Department of Human Services is publishing um, guidance to their workers, and in it they want to publish our phone number, uh, Law Help MN, resources like the city of Minneapolis, like Smurls, to say contact a trusted individual, contact a lawyer before you take action, either to deny yourself a benefit or to disenroll from a benefit. But that's, that's all about the impact. I just wanted to say one thing about the, the comments. The other two suggestions, the suggestions you make are great. The, these are really good examples of comments. Um, I understand from the national, you can go online and find Protecting Immigrant Families has some great resources about this. Um, but we really feel um, the, Please don't make helpful suggestions. Don't make the suggestion, you could do this if you did it this way. They're going to use that. So um, they are going to have to deal with the fact that most of the comments, most of the 99,000, over 100,000 that'll come in, have been in opposition. Um, and so that's why, again, for the asylum rule, you want to make a comment because otherwise the only comments that are out there are half and half. Um, and then I, I understand that the lag time for the uptake, if you want to do it online, is, is getting slower and, slow, and getting longer and longer. So don't wait till the last day. Other questions? This has a mic first. Hi, I'm uh, Rhonda Jones Webb with the Office of Postdoctoral Initiatives in the Graduate School, and I'm particularly concerned about the effect of this regulation on our ability to really um, recruit um, outstanding um, uh, postdoctoral fellows as well as graduate students. So um, my name is Marissa, I'm the director of the immigration response team here at the university and we've um, definitely been working with undocumented students, DACA students, U.S. citizens, students who come from mixed immigration status families who are trying to sort of navigate a lot of the same issues that, that were mentioned that, you know, high school students are having about what steps should they take, um, can they safely take. They're thinking not just about themselves, but about their family members that are here. And so I think, um, I think that that's a, a dialogue that, that we should continue having both within the university and outside the university, and we could certainly connect afterwards, but I think that, um, your comment sort of points out that it's it's everything from families that are worried about sending their kids to Head Start to potential outstanding graduate students who are trying to figure out whether they can safely pursue the career and academic future that they want because of rules like this. Thank you for your comment. To Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Thal, practicing immigration attorney. Um, it was mentioned that naturalization applicants and green card renewals will not be subject to the proposed rule. What about conditional residency status, removing that um, to convert from two-year green card to 10-year green card? I don't think that it applies. To that they are, they hold on, Peggy. Hey, hold on, Peggy. And if you could introduce yourself. I'm Peggy Russell, uh, an immigration attorney at Legal Aid, and it's our opinion that it doesn't apply because they are a permanent, they are a resident. That determination has been made, um, so that uh, that's not going to be involved in the in the evaluation. But it's not specifically stated that way. 
Whereas are you? Oh, no, I pass the I just wanted to ask if after submitting your public comment, it would be helpful at all to CC any policymakers? Uh, John Keller from the Immigrant Law Center. <clears throat> uh, so thanks for the question. Part of uh, our work, in addition to the education and outreach, uh, is around uh, organizing diverse comments uh, being directed towards um, uh, the federal government uh, before December 10th. So I want to say a couple things and then address your question specifically. Um, one of our goals uh, and in con connection with the national efforts is to try to drive comments from all of our congressional districts. Um, and it, it makes sense uh, because of your comment uh, and I think because of what follows the closing of the comments and the likely publishing of a rule very similar to this uh, initial uh, draft. Um, so my first request is, if you haven't submitted a comment yet, please do that. Um, it may feel, uh, we get the question, is it helpful? You know, is it just a waste of time since they're gonna do something bad anyways? And the answer is yes. Uh, but don't just do it yourself. Please reach out to your connections in greater Minnesota, whatever those are, because we know the majority of comments coming from Minnesota are going to be driven from the metro. Um, and we really, really want to make, if even half of you uh, uh, were able to make that um, connection with folks in greater Minnesota, that could be really helpful today. Uh, the second thing, um, if you want something even easier, please sign up for ILCM's action alerts at our website. We'll do a final push early next week that you can you know, send out to your networks. And if you're not already on our action alert, uh, you can do that. You can uh, just find us at ILCM.org. Um, and then the third is ultimately we want to be able to kind of link back to the comments that were made <clears throat> from uh, the congressional districts when we meet with those Congress people uh, and ask them particularly to exercise oversight over what we may predict is a, a disregard of the vast uh, number of comments in opposition to these to these rules. Um, I also wanted to stand, uh, thank the students. Uh, great job, Steve. I think you're a cruel professor for asking them to research this. Um, but you did an amazing job on some terrible, terrible stuff to try to work through. Um, I also want to kind of uh, share that this effort to push back on this uh, doesn't end on December 10th. We're really looking at three phases to this moment that we're living uh, around uh, public charge. So this is really phase one. Um, and the outreach to the directly affected communities is important, uh, as my colleagues have shared, to try to keep everybody using benefits that are for their uh, overall family best interest uh, until there is change. Uh, phase two will really be from the close of the comments uh, until we see those published uh, final uh, rules. Uh, and I think we'll probably need to do an updated round of communications, of outreach, of uh, helping people prepare uh, for those rules to come into uh, finality. Um, and then phase three is after there is a final rule. We don't know when that will be. What When we're asked that question, we're saying the earliest likely um, uh, time that this will go into effect will probably be February of 2019. And that's also some, it used to be more reassuring to folks um, uh, a few weeks ago or, or a couple months ago. But it's still helpful um, if you have somebody who's feeling like they need to get off of benefits immediately to let them know uh, that nothing has changed uh, and that nothing is likely to change before uh, February. We think it will be later than that. Um, there are uh, national efforts around multiple ways in which we're, we're trying to fight back against this, including litigation strategizing. Uh, we have a pro bono law firm that's supporting uh, our office uh, and, um, and some other stakeholders. And we've been part of national calls around that front as well. Uh, our hope also is that the entering attorney general from Minnesota will be engaged uh, on this issue. So far, we've gotten very positive uh, feedback from them. And the last thing I'll say is we've created a, a bilingual front and back English-Spanish, like top five things directly affected communities need to know 
um, sort of for this phase one, and we'll be updating that. It's also on our website. Uh, I'll leave them down where the other materials are. Thanks. Are there other questions? Hi, I work for a community health center in Mankato, and you know, sh most, uh, certainly p patients who become uninsured patients is going to affect us financially. So I was just wondering if, um, kind of a two-part question, if there's any resources that might specifically help health centers and help to inform our leadership, um, and then also resources or advice on how we might um, alleviate any concerns about being a 501c3 nonprofit, you know, and participating in the, in the public comment. Looks like she wants to answer. <laughs> yeah, again, I would recommend you go to protectingimmigrantfamilies.org. There's a, a swath of stuff about public health and uh, pu federally qualified clinics. There's also very reassuring information about the fact that um, submitting comments is not lobbying the government. Um, submitting comments is everyone's right. As an organization, you have a right to do that. There are contracted organizations that contract with the Department of Homeland Security that get to submit comments. Um, they're not allowed to take retaliate against a contract. So you're fine with that. And then there is, again, there's nothing wrong with saying this will hurt our financial situation. And it, that's, they're expecting comments and they've been really pouring in from hospitals and community clinics about the fact that you, we, you know, we've climbed out of a hole by having more and more people insured. The Congress gave extra money for clinics that serve people who aren't insured, and now you're gonna drive us back. Um, hospitals will close, clinics will close, patients will be afraid to come in except for emergency care. Um, I think John wants to comment. Can I add one thing to that question? Mm -hmm. I think one of the first requests we got to um, kind of address this impact was from uh, the safety net uh, providers here in Minnesota. And so we did a, a webinar that was just for leadership of all of the, the uh, clinics. And um, I was very kind of heartened that I think every CEO of those uh, uh, clinics was on and the lobbying folks Uh, were the ones that you know designated created materials. So I, I think upper management fully understands the gravity, and I would check with them and, and with the lobbying folks to make sure that they are following through. Uh, Jean Kildow, immigration attorney. Do I understand correctly that this is not retroactive? So if we have a client that's receiving benefits now or has in the past, and then stops, and then we're applying for say a green card it's not going to count at all and there's not going to be any sort of future gotcha by the Trump administration or I mean how yes I don't know if anyone wants to make that guarantee <laughs> I would say you know what's written in the draft is exactly that that uh, the, there will be no look back um, um, and so that's what we're you know, communicating. Uh, I doubt that they're going to be getting comments suggesting that they should be looking back. You know, I don't think we'll be able to tell with certainty until the final rule is published, but uh, they've been explicit uh, that there will not be a look back uh, once the final rule uh, goes into effect. Okay, and then one more um, related question. I Maybe I misunderstood, but is it the thought that this proposed rule, when enacted, will also be applicable to immigration petitioners and affiants on the affidavit of support who, I mean, obviously if they're currently, or I don't know if it's obvious or not, if they're currently receiving some sort of benefit, I mean, it's hard to envision a situation in which they would qualify to be an affiant, but maybe when you have like a spouse petitioner that really can't meet the requirement, but they get a second aff affidavit of support, it, is their loved one going to not qualify because the primary affiant is on benefits? I, I think part of what 
you know, we've been having conversations about is, again, the proposed rule is explicit that this is a test of the future entering immigrant, of the person who's seeking admission. Um, and in juxtaposition from the previous leaked draft rule uh, that was worse, um, and that previous leaked draft rule did include household use of benefits. So that's where the community is confused. <clears throat> you know, all of us, I think, were up in arms about U.S. citizen children in a household of an intending or future immigrant would be triggering it. So to answer the question, that is not what's written in the proposed rule. Um, we've also been very aware of and trying to understand the impact of what the Department of State has already done through the rule, um, through the uh, bulletin that was published in January of 2018. So we've, at this point, sort of bifurcate our presentations on this between what's happening abroad if your intending immigrant is going to be consular processing, because that revised memo in January of 2018 does broaden the scope that consular officers can look at, including uh, receipt by household members. So at, at this point, why this happened, I don't think we know. But this, the Department of State and the FAM published a rule that I think conformed more to the more punitive draft than what we're dealing with in this draft. There's a general hope, maybe, um, and maybe a reliance on past rule making that when this rule becomes final, FAM will then conform to the less punitive rule, if, if any of that makes sense. Um, uh, I hope that it was, or maybe Peggy wants to add. Do you mind, just quick? So the one comment I wanted to make with regard to the petitioner sponsor for the affidavit of support is there, in the rule, in the proposed rule, it does state that an insufficient affidavit of support would lead to a decision that the alien is inadmissible based upon public charge. So if the sponsor is unable to show income sufficient for an affidavit of support in a situation where typically you have a joint sponsor and that would be it, the problem would be solved. The problem is not solved under this proposed rule because the beneficiary would then definitively be a public charge, and then you'd get to the next part of the proposed rule where um, DHS and its discretion could offer the possibility of paying a public charge bond. Oh, I just wanted to note that there's a lawsuit filed um, in the city of Baltimore challenging the FAM, the Foreign Affairs Manual provision. Um, so that will be interesting to follow. And the other point I wanted to make is that I think it's going to be really difficult for immigration officers to wade through this and make decisions because there's so many different factors um, that need to be weighed. And that's where it's re really important for an applicant to get an attorney to really set it up properly and make it clear um, what the positive factors are and what the negative factors, if the rule becomes final. Hopefully it won't, but. Any more questions? We're, we're about, yeah. oh, Steve, you have one more? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Wanted to follow up on Jean's comment and um, uh, in terms of affidavit of support sponsors, uh, are we likely to see more resistance of affidavit of support sponsors coming forward to uh, be involved in the process? Or are we also likely to see more litigation on affidavit of support sponsorship? I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I think the answer is a little bit of a rhetorical question, I think, Steve. The answer is, I think, true that any time you're telling the immigrant community or the mixed status community that there's going to be more scrutiny around the future earnings or the future public benefits of somebody coming in, that that does chill and is chilling folks. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that Ayla can provide some kind of real-time tracking to verify some of these questions, particularly around the impact of the FAM rule. If they've already done it, I haven't seen it. Um, 
around litigation, I don't know if I have an answer for litigation. I mean, I, I, I think it will motivate my, my off the cuff answer is I think it will motivate jurisdictions that are already interested or may have a track record of litigating around uh, this issue. Uh, just like where you see more aggressive law enforcement because of the kind of rhetoric coming out of the White House. That's my, that's my assessment. Yeah. We're going to wrap up, and yeah. um, uh, Marissa is going to uh, close yeah. things for us. I'll just end things briefly by thanking you for coming and for being interested in this issue. For some of you, I know you're immigration attorneys and you're working in this every day, but for lots of you, I know that this is um, – closely related to the people and communities you're working with, but that immigration law isn't something you spend every day tussling with. So thank you for being here and for your interest. And I just want to really urge you to put your own experience and expertise into a comment. Um, I think lots of immigration lawyers comment on proposed rules that have to do with immigration, but this rule is unique because I think people who work in public health and education and community outreach and lots of different areas really have expertise that the government needs to hear on this rule. So I would urge you to not wait until December 10th and to submit a comment and put your own knowledge and experience into it. They have There are lots of ways to submit a form comment, but the requirement that they uh, review and consider the comment is for unique comments. Um, so I'd urge you, it doesn't have to be terribly long, it doesn't have to be an essay, um, but it should be unique and, and put your own perspective into it. Um, for people who are affiliated with the university, um, the immigration response team is happy to help answer questions or um, help you with with your comment. Um, I'm going to be writing my own, so I probably don't want to write yours. Um, but I'm happy, you know, happy to be a resource if people want to ask. And there are lots of really great community resources that are available to people affiliated with the university or not. Um, you've heard from a lot of experts in the room, so thank you to them for being here, too. Um, I don't, if you're submitting one, that's a good prompt, John, thank you. Tell me if you're submitting one. I already know that we have them coming from, from Boynton Health um, Services and from other places around campus, um, but I don't know. I don't know, hopefully lots. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks all for being here. Thanks so much, and thanks, thanks again to the-, to the, the yeah. <laughs>